Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be on a panel with such, under, I mean, overachievers. My goodness, what a, what a record of uh, public service, both in, in journalism and in politics. Um, this is an intersection that's a difficult one. Um, what is the relationship between the media and uh, politicians in Canada? And uh, I think I'm going to begin with Fazil and put our broad question to him. Um, what is wrong with politics in Canada if you think about it through the lens of a media person? Um, there's a presumption, I think, out there that uh, the media uh, are people who watch from the bleachers, uh, wait till the contest is over, uh, there's a battle, uh, people are lying bloodied on the floor, we are happy to come down and kick you in the chin or the groin. <laughs> I think that view, I think, is mistaken. I think the, the big challenge, I think, for politics and democracy in Canada right now is the challenges that the media face as we transition. Uh, in short, we are in a world in which there are major business challenges, so consequently, uh, we don't have as many teeth as we had 20 years ago. We our teeth are not as sharp as they were 20 years ago. Um, the, on the other hand, governments and politicians' teeth have become longer and sharper because when you, look, when you look at the public relations and communications branches of governments, they rival, if not exceed, the capacity of many news outlets. So to me, that I'm looking at it for Canadian democracy and to hold politicians accountable, we need to have a strong media. Obviously, this is self-interested, I'm sure you're all going to say. But the fact is, we are not note takers for politicians. We simply aren't. We are watchdogs. There is broad public interest. Are they following the broad public, public interest or not? We have to hold them accountable because they have got legalized power in their hands. So I want to, when I send a, somebody to report on a news story, I want that reporter prepped and ready to do a good story, ask the tough questions. So, for instance, I'm make, these are real life examples which I'm going to give you, is when there's a politician who gets up in the BC legislature and says, the BC Liberals have been slashing and burning healthcare spending over the last 10 years, my response is, well, take a look at the public accounts and then go do some remedial math. That's simply not true. Um, when the conservative government in Ottawa says we need harsher penalties to reduce crime, my response is, well, show me the studies. Uh, when you have got politicians talking about how judges make law, we don't want judges to make law, we are the legislators, we should make law, my response is, well, let's take right from the top, abortion, gay marriage, uh, now we are getting into polygamy as well as into assisted suicide. In each one of those cases, they have punted the ball to the courts and then they say you should not make law. Well, which is it? Right? <laughs> so for me, I want to be able to ask the tough questions. To me, the challenge is when there's a reporter doing three stories a day as opposed to one, that means they cannot be prepped enough to ask Anne McClellan the tough questions or Pam, the tough questions. And to me, that is a bigger challenge for me today than whether good people are getting into politics because my goal is we need to have public policy which reaches the goals that we intend to have. If you misdiagnose the problem and I let politicians get away with this nonsense, then clearly we are not going to reach the goals that we have set out. The reason I'm coming out firing is because I realize as the media, I got to defend myself the royal we. So I'll stop there. I think, I, just let me say, I think his teeth are plenty sharp. <laughs> Why don't you go oh, and okay. uh, make our next comments to the question. Okay. Um, let me first of all say, um, Don Newman, who probably all of you in this room know from his many years in politics, when I left politics said, Anne, you're one of the politicians I can truly say never mastered the 30-second soundbite. And that is <laughs> so true. Um, and therefore, uh, maybe an entree to the fact that my relationship with the media of all kinds was mixed. 
And when I went into politics, I saw them as my adversary, not as an enemy, but as an adversary. Because? Um, I think, first of all, coming from my background as a lawyer and law professor and, and dealing with the media before, I, I realized that uh, the media had a tendency, in my opinion, to what I would say, dumb down very complex issues, right? And so you end up with a, a headline. And in fact, when I was Minister of Justice, the National Press Gallery, one day, I remember uh, one of the senior members of the Press Gallery saying, Minister, if it bleeds, it leads, right? And uh, personally, I find that offensive, both as a lawyer and as a Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. So I, I think I saw them as my adversary in the sense they were something I had to get over to actually do my job and actually try and reach into the public and help the public understand what my objectives were and what my goals or outcomes were. Um, finally, I think I realized that I was not going to win if, you, if there was anything to win here in terms of, of uh, my uh, antagonism, if you like, to the media. And by that time, I'd also gone through three directors of communication. So their lives were hell because of my attitude toward the press. So I think uh, I came to realize, and I think more politicians, especially ministers, which I was for almost 13 years in the government of Canada, I think we need to understand what the role of the press is and how we can actually um, not use the press in a manipulative way, but in fact work with the press to achieve objectives. You want a good story, I want my story told, right? And that doesn't mean you are going to cut me slack or everything in the article is going to be good, but I think that there is a symbiotic relationship here that a lot of politicians don't understand, and I think that's something politicians, especially in government, uh, need to understand if they're going to succeed. Let, let me get Winnie in yeah. here um, now, and then we'll come back to you. I, in I, just said, I never mastered the 30 <laughs> second sound. Up. You do beautifully, though, in two minutes. <laughs> Winnie, your thoughts so far? Um, to address the question of what is wrong with politics today, and I, I kept thinking that if I look at politics as a, a treasure chest, as a box, you open it up and unfortunately right now, I think it's pretty empty right now inside. Um, I'm seeing politicians running out of ideas. I've seen politicians, um, the, the most unfortunate kind would be the wannabe politicians, as Carol was talking about, and also Fawn was talking about in the last panel, that people who came into, you know, went into politics or want to be uh, for the wrong reason, for vanity, for, you know, especially in my community, in the Chinese community, um, we want to be in there, but then for what reason? Is it because uh, it's a Chinese MP? That is, wow. But that's not the reason. You need to know what you want to do. So. Um, we see a lot of the lack of issues, uh, lack of ideas, um, and also too please, too, too, too eager to please uh, on, the, on the part of uh, the political parties and the politicians. But at the same time, I'm not going to be defending um, Basile because uh, I'm also you know, now in an activist role in an environmental movement. And that allows me to be able to have some distance to see how my journalist friends are doing. And I also see that the problem is not just one-sided with politicians. If I'm saying that the treasure chest is empty in politics, I'm also seeing that the journalists that we, we think that we ask the tough questions, but sometimes really great questions and issues come to our faces and we either we don't recognize it or we don't even know what's going on and no follow-up. And you know, I'll elaborate more on that, but then the 2011 federal election was a good example of journalists need to be re-energized, re-educated, and go out and ask the good questions. But when a good issue comes to you, you've got to be able to recognize it. So you're talking about it as a relationship Absolutely. then, there's both. Mm -hmm. Pam? I think uh, Anne is right about as a politician when you first arrive. You really do feel a little under attack. Um, but for me, and I really don't like going over and over this, but I had been elected for about two days before the West Vancouver Police Department was in a whole bunch of publicly recognized trouble. And it had been for a long time. And I was perfectly willing to take that on. What I didn't realize was the public didn't know that there was an issue. Uh, and the media uh, was instrumental in bringing that issue to light. 
And because I had to tell my story, I had to very quickly recognize this is a, a, a relationship that is required in a free, open country. And they beat the crap out of me. I mean, it wasn't fun. Um, but it was about six months in, people started to actually say, you look old and tired, and I think you're getting a sympathy vote <laughs> by how the media <laughs> are treating you on this. But in the end, in the long run, Everything is better off from a public policy and public accountability point of view. So I think, in a way, I was grateful for uh, it being so difficult so early on in my public career so that I could recognize, show up, answer the calls, be available. Sometimes it's rough. Sometimes it's fine. But I think uh, if people in public life go, would go a long way by stopping being critical of the media because we're, we are the story. And we are accountable to that story. So are you saying that, that um, you got beaten up because you were too close to the media and you weren't willing to entertain their questions? And I didn't know what I was doing, for one. Uh, I had to get up to speed on a file that was partly confidential, partly public. Uh, the public are the ones that hold particularly, look at what's going on with the RCMP. The public have a crucial role to pay, play in transparency with regard to public safety and the public uh, good. And so I learned really fast, and I would actually credit the media with my need to learn that quickly. Okay, you know that's on the record, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> Just saying. Um, <laughs> if, you, if, if you have Twitter questions that you would like to pose, um, we have people with cards. You're welcome to fill them out so that we can pose those in the room right now. We have two people with microphones. If there are questions that come up that you want to, Jennifer's right in the front row here wanting to ask a question right away, so we'll get a microphone down to you. Terrific. So journalism absolutely depends on trust. I mean, the, the number one pillar of journalism and journalism ethics is truth and accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, politicians are talking about things like messages and how to, how to sort of get their story out. How do you reconcile those two competing or seemingly competing demands? Anne, do you want to? I actually don't think they are competing. Now, it is true that uh, every politician, every department, PMO, uh, will have a spin. We get talking points. We uh, have a spin that we want to put on a story to help Canadians understand why we're doing something and what our reason is for doing this. Um, I am the first to concede that uh, and understand that the media's job is not to accept my spin. And the media's job is to dig a lot deeper than that and figure out uh, real motivations, unintended consequences. The media can be great at actually helping government identify unintended consequences. Government's not very good at that, actually. Now I feel better. Good. But just before I move on, I, I just want to say, to Facile's point about, um, I think, uh, being able to do your job today, I've got to say, my experience in government was that the best journalists I ever dealt with were the best informed, the so-called specialist or well-informed generalist. I'll give you one example. Dan Gardner, the Ottawa citizen, he writes the best stuff in this country on law and order. Did he ever say a nice word about me? If so, I missed it. <laughs> but I preferred to deal with him day in, day out, than I did the people I had to explain why the criminal code was federal law, and let's start from there, right? Dan Gardner knew what he was talking about, he understood the issues, and he pushed me and my communications people in my department to be better at crafting our messages and explaining to the public why we were doing something. So I, uh, I just don't see, you know, there may be churn between the spin and what the journalist has to do. But I do think at the end of the day, um, you know, if we understand each other's roles and respect each other, I think we get to usually a good place. I'm going to come back to that question of respect because that, that is a huge issue. I'm going to go to Jennifer Clark now from the floor. My question comes from the perspective of having been both an elected politician and, and having been a journalist, and boy, what a different place each is, and, and very much support um, both what Anne and Pam have said about well-informed journalists and asking the questions and forcing us who hold uh, public office to know our files, to be responsive, et cetera. That's great, but what happens when there is no question asked 
but there's an opinion printed. And those journalists who do not do their own fact-checking, who do not do, and, and who follow along on a trail of somebody else has written something. And it was uh, just a funny thing. Um, uh, uh, Vaughn Palmer walked out, and I'm sorry he's not here to hear this, but I remember at, w at one point in, in my career saying, uh, he wrote something, and I, I said, uh, Vaughn, have I ever failed to return a phone call? No. Have you ever met me before? Have you ever tried to ask the question? Have you ever, et cetera, et cetera, forth and so on. And he said, I've never met you. You've never, I've never phoned you. I've never tried, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a very good journalist, and he does an excellent job. But that's an, a, an example, uh, and it's a personal one, but I think most of us in public life can give you a number of them where somebody starts a trail of, of stories that's way off the mark. How do you handle that? As a journal, as journalists, and not trying to make people defensive, but I think that's a real fact, and it, it is perhaps the thing that sparks the growth of PR departments and all of these other specialists. It's that kind of thing. Perhaps, Pamela. Well, I've had a little media training, probably less than you might think I've had, because that's right. It almost teaches you to run interference, and I think particularly in the times we're living in, that are open and transparent. You want to be authentic, and you want to be able to deal face-to-face -face with anybody. Iona Campagnolo gave me a really good piece of advice when we were fighting the Eagle Ridge Bluffs uh, uh, Sea to Sky Highway. She said, you get right back up on that horse. That's why you were elected. Of course it's going to be hard. She says, I've lost way more times than I've won. And when you look at the panel that was here before, and, and certainly in that category, dignified people, strong partisanship, beaten up by the media and probably also complimented by the media. But for us to put our public trust in those people, we think they're going to be good at that. And if they're not, they're going to learn to be good at that. And that's how we, I think, realize our, our potential as a society. Uh, to answer Jennifer's question. Um, Didn't I do that? And, <laughs> and to answer your question, and to answer your question too, Pam. Look, it's in my self-interest to ensure that we have a credible newspaper and credible news, okay? It's my calling card. I want people to come in and click onto VancouverSun.com because that's my calling card. So we, when we are doing stories, we are looking for balance. We're trying to lay out both sides of the story. We are raising questions of fairness, editors do, on a daily basis. We ask ourselves whether this is in the public interest, should we be even reporting this? Uh, where should it be placed? Right? I mean, these are questions that we go through daily. Uh, we routinely kill stories which we don't think should make the page for a variety of reasons. I'll give you one quick example where we could have sold a lot of newspapers. It was a particularly uh, interesting bit of gossip, he said, she said, piece, which could have run on the front page, and we could have sold perhaps 5,000 extra single copies. I said, uh, look, I need, uh, I need this double-sourced. Actually, I need this triple source because people's reputation are at stake. Um, the person said to me, no, um, no way, I don't need to do that. This is a good story, you should run with it. I said, no, I'm not going to run. It went up the chain to the top. So we had to go into the boardroom, sit the reporter down. We Both of us sat down, the editor in chief and me, and said, this is not going to run. Here are the reasons why because it's the reputation, your reputation as a journalist, and the reputation of the newspaper. So, look, we are not, we want sources on record. Vancouver Sun will not run stories without people being on the record. We do not run unattributed sources. We will not do it. We try to double source every story. If we cannot, some days we do, some days we cannot. And do we get it right every day? No. But we do get it wrong. We have an A2 correction the next day, and right now, now we do online corrections immediately. Tell me another institution in our society which has this level of accountability. Universities, politicians, governments. So it's important for us to be credible. So we do check these things. I mean, certainly we don't want to use secondary sources. We certainly want to go to primary sources. Sometimes we can't. Believe me, we're on a deadline. Eight o'clock, I'm standing over the guy and saying, send that page across, because I need to get it out, right? Otherwise, it's going to cost me a pretty penny for a late production. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging world, but at the same time, that's not to suggest that we can be lazy about it. 
I see a question in the back of the room, and I believe we have a Twitter question as well. Okay. We have two, we have two questions here about gender in politics. So related to Carol Taylor's characterization of some of her opinions and views as either naive or idealistic, we have the question, would Carol's position be interpreted by the media as thoughtful or weak? And as a corollary, do you think women face different levels of scrutiny in the media in politics? Let, let's go to you, Winnie. Uh, I have to say that no, immediately when you mentioned that question, I uh, thought of Christy Clark and the recent mm -hmm. reference to her showing too much cleavage. And you know that would only happen to a woman politician, just because we have it. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and the cameras are on the ceiling. Absolutely. <laughs> but the question, of course, is that why are you looking for these things? Why are you not yeah. listening to what she has to tell us? So that is, you know, that is definitely a concern. And I, think, I do think that women politicians do get a different set of values, uh, judgment, and, and it's totally <coughs> grossly unfair. And do you think that's because women uh, participate in politics differently or because it's, it's just people are looking at them as a woman as opposed to a man? Well, I think the previous panel was a good indication. We heard Carol talking about the emotional side of things, um, the, uh, the uh, compromise and also listening to different opinions, um, the ability to allow different voices. And then we hear the men on this side saying no, it's got to be uh, a boxing match all the time. And I was thinking, and I was talking with my, uh, my colleague at the foundation, and we were both women. And surprisingly, we both agree that we're actually siding with the red rather than the black. And so it, it actually does have a, a big difference. And I would also add that women actually do have a different set of values also. So even when Carol was talking about um, the 49-year-old, the 50-year-old, that's the best age for women to get into politics because they don't have all the baggages, the kids are gone, and they can be left alone. But at the same time, it's not as simple as that because at that age, you also probably have a teenager who's really concerned about his image. And if he sees mom on the front page of paper being labeled as she's really dumb or she's an idiot, I mean, she's, you're not going to be a good mom and then you're going to have hell that evening and for the rest of your life, probably. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it is different for mm. women. Let me just say, when I left politics in January 06, that's a euphemistic way of saying I lost. Um, <laughs> in fact, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that's for <laughs> honesty and everything. Um, I, I was asked to do uh, participate in our party's renewal pro uh, efforts, and uh, I decided that what I wanted to do was look at why we as a Liberal Party weren't nominating more women and getting more of them elected, because it certainly had been a publicly stated goal of our party f for some uh, almost 15 years by that point. And so I traveled across the country talking to women, and this very quickly became a nonpartisan event. So you had w women everywhere wanting to come out, whether they were Aboriginal women, New Canadians, women who'd never belonged to parties, and so on, wanted to come out and talk among themselves about why there weren't more of them standing for elected office. And there were three things, and one of them is relevant to this discussion, and none of them will surprise any of you. One was work-life balance, one was the culture of politics, and the third was the media. That, and to your point, Winnie, women told me over and over again that, and it wasn't primarily about them, because these are women who are strong people, and they, if, if they can defend themselves and express their views. Their concern was for their children. What I found interesting was they seemed to have very little concern for partners or spouses in this regard. But in terms of children, they said, you know what? I don't want my child to have to see what the press says about Belinda Stronach, for example, or the press says about Christy Clark's cleavage, or whatever the case may be. Um, and they don't want that in relation to themselves for their children, and their children then going to school and having to defend themselves. But surely that's a concern that's shared by men. Uh, okay, let not me give you a so much, there. not let me, so much. No, no, hold on, but let me give you a quick example. It happened two weeks ago, local government election here in Vancouver, it was 9 th 10 o'clock in the night, the results start coming in, I'm in the office on a Saturday. We do work hard, by the way. <laughs> um, so I'm in there, and we're going to do an online edition, and I got copy flowing in, and there's a description of Mayor Gregor Robertson in the copy. So I'm looking at this copy, 
before I pressed the button and I said, you know what? Would we, would we actually allow this description to go through if it was a female male? And I asked our city editor, I said, you know, would we? She said, no. I said, then we are taking this thing out, right? So we had a discussion about whether we should take it out. And she was insistent that we should take it out. We did. So we applied the same standard when it came to a descriptor of Mayor Robertson as opposed to a female politician. So, I mean, we are sensitized Good. to that extent. So, uh, the example of, I'm trying to demystify for you what goes on inside the newsroom. Uh, because there seems to be this presumption that somehow that we are sitting there trying to write stories and trying to go after people and do the gotcha stuff. Well, we are not most of the time. When we do do gotcha stuff, there's a good reason for it, right? So, you know, when politicians, when, when I hear things which are patently false, and when people say things which, when they say one plus one does not equal two, I'm sorry, we have been through the dark ages, we have been through renaissance, I'm not going to run that in a major metropolitan daily in the 21st century. I just am not going to, so. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear you did that um, for very good looking Mayor Robertson. Um, <laughs> When I, there was a, there was a cover st story, I think, in the Vancouver Magazine about me, and it was all about hair and clothes. And I did speak to the editor, and I said, is this really necessary? And I have a whole bunch of public policy questions I'd like to discuss. And he said, get over it. You're in public life. This is going to be part of whatever, you know, we, so I think it's both. Um, with regard to the women, the real issue, I, I believe Canada is 52nd in the world in terms of equal representation between the genders. It's just appalling. I mean, really, what are we 52nd on in any other regard? But I think it's about inclusion. It's, it's not just gender, it's, and I really think Carol made an excellent point about that. And it isn't because uh, I don't think, I, I try not to uh, generalize about how different genders approach things. It's because it's just more interesting it's more rooted in the fabric of society if you've been able to in be inclusive. And it's also, once you go down that path, it's addictive because you're very aware of what you're missing. If you find yourself in a lopsided situation again, and I've spent most of my career being the only woman in an awful lot of situations. Uh, so, you know, I also, um, I think that there was that tension, Mike, on the first stage, and I guarantee you a lot of women in the audience were thinking, you know, Carol, you could actually come on a little stronger for the idea that it's not always about beating up the other guy. It certainly can be about finessing. It can certainly be about a more sophisticated argument and about reaching out rather than exploiting. And I've watched the media pick up on that kind of leadership, and I think that that's what people are looking for. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, which we can talk about as well, about whether you, you bring more women in so that the system changes or whether you change the system to bring more women in. Can I it's, say one more thing? Okay. I was picking up my dry cleaning once, and the woman said to me, you know, you look actually kind of fat on TV. <laughs> and I said to her, do you say this to the men who come in who actually are fat? Or, are, are, you know, like, I don't know that you hear that very much. No. Wow. <laughs> All right, question from the floor, please. And a question, if you will, please, sir. Uh, my question is, when our media is uh, financed by, I mean, funded by government or by big corporation or business, how independent it could be? Either or public broadcasting, like CBC, is yeah. budgeted. So isn't it better to have a special tax just for media, uh, uh, like public media, like CBC? Mm -hmm. Why the CBC should not have a special just tax coming from public? to stay independent, so I think this is. Well, I, I, I am no longer an employee of the CBC. I'm a contract employee at the CBC, so I do not speak for the corporation, nor do I speak for the media, nor do my colleagues speak for the media, just to, to put that out there. As an individual, I would say that I have never experienced any editorial direction outside of my immediate production team. I have never been told that I cannot ask this question or I cannot cover that story because of some sort of political interference. There's complete independence in terms of journalism, and, and that is my experience. Fazil, I don't know if you want to weigh in. Look, 
I mean, there is separation of church and state uh, when it comes to the editorial guides versus the editorial. I mean, we maintain that. Uh, so are there challenges at times when people say, oh, well, you know, why are you do, uh, doing a really ba bad story on us? Well, you know what? We cover plane crashes. We don't cover plane landings, right? I mean, we are in the news business, N-E-W, new. So consequently, we don't, I mean, you, you cannot, if you're going to have credibility, if, let's, I can explain it to the advertiser. I could say, look, do you want your message to reach 550,000 people daily? Well, if so, um, the newspaper has to have credibility and trust. So we have to do the stories that we have to do. Otherwise, you're not even going to reach the audience that you want. So I have never had anybody tell me, oh, well, you can't run this or you can't. It doesn't happen. I mean, we try to maintain, uh, we do maintain that independence. Uh, another qu Twitter question, okay. Uh, we have a question actually here from a journalist in the room who brings us this card. What does the panel think about media training for politicians? Ah, uh, media training. Um, I, I actually think this one, that, that kind of gets to the heart of the matter because um, if politicians are coming in and seeing the media as a, sort of this monolithic adversary, um, we got a problem right, right from the get-go. If we're talking about respect and integrity and personal relationships in order to figure out what people think and hash through their ideas, you have to have some sort of a connection. There can't be a wall between. So media training, uh, Winnie, what do you think of the, the way that it's infused our conversation in Canada? Uh, to me, media training for politician is a nightmare because I remember in my days as a news director and the worst case scenario is to interview someone who has just gone through media training or has had a lot of media training because what you end up having is that they don't answer the question, they smile all the time, they're really nice to you, but then they just don't give you the answer and they're not listening. And that's the worst. So we don't want media training for politicians, but we want more media training for our own journalists. Yeah. <laughs> so as someone who burned through three directors of communications, mm -hmm. Ms. McClellan. Mm -hmm. What do you think well, of the role of media training? They working for me. <laughs> yeah. They did. Um, I actually think uh, you're never, at, the, at least at the national level, if you're in the government and you're in cabinet, uh, you're not going to avoid media training. Media Why do you need it, though? Why? I think, in fact, at the, uh, and here I am speaking at the national level, when you come out of question period the first time and you're in your first scrum, right, you had better understand some basic things. Otherwise, your career could probably end right there. Although, I will say, I think with new ministers, the media in Ottawa, they're pretty good. They cut people slack, right? They know this is the first time out and that kind of thing. But um, I think media training is relevant. I, I can't imagine many ministers uh, who don't get media training, um, either of their own volition or directed by PMO. Um, I, I unfortunately, I think, failed all my courses in media training. That's why I didn't master that 30-second soundbite thing. But what's the I, purpose of media training? But part of it is, for example, you come out of question period into the scrum, all these lights and microphones. Where do you go first? Whose question do you take first? What tone should you use? How long should you answer a question? And so on. These are basic things that a lot of people don't come to Ottawa with any knowledge of. They haven't lived their life in the public eye, at least not that level of scrutiny before. And it's like t sending, you know, a lamb to the slaughter in the sense if you put them out there, and, and quite truthfully, I have watched colleagues wither and die out there. It doesn't mean that their career is over, but they've got to come from behind. And therefore, media training can, can blunt some of those sharp edges. Doesn't mean it solves all the problems, but it can help you and it can also give you a little bit of confidence that when you go out there for the first time, you've, you've got some sense of what to expect and what to do. And it's not magic, there's no magic in any of this, but it, I think, just helps blunt some of that, those rough edges. Pamela? But this is kind of, kind of going to sound funny. I think one of the benefits is how to get an idea into two sentences full stop. But 
and has been very successful with a different approach. <laughs> so I don't know if I call it media training. Any politician that's going to do well better be able to articulate an, an idea quick, quick, quickly and clearly, and it's a public idea. So to that extent, that's helpful. But I totally agree with Winnie. Um, when the media comes at you and says something like, why is TransLink wasting our money? And you know, it, by all measures combined, it's the third most best run transit authority in North America. It's hard to answer that question. So you need to be able to answer the question in a way that is informative. And I agree. I have actually asked media trainers to, let's just stop the session. I'm going to stop paying you because I don't want to become skilled in, in avoiding things. It, it will not play well for anybody. So it's a different, I think, but Anne, I think what you're trying to get at as well is let's support our politicians to be good communicators. Bazile, when you hear media training? I'm not averse to media training. Uh, I think people need to be able to articulate and express themselves clearly about what their policy positions are. Uh, I'm not in the business of trying to put hurdles on the path of Pam or uh, Anne. Uh, that's not what I do. I mean, on the op-ed pages of the Vancouver Sun, we, give, we sharply delineate different points of view by providing different perspectives. And so when somebody writes something and sends it to me, I say, you know, this is all throat clearing which you're doing. You know, you might want to take that out because you're not getting to the point. Um, so, and you're going verbose. You're a thousand words. You know what? People's attention spans can't last that long. So, and by the way, I also have space constraints and I need to put some color so that people can actually look at the page. Uh, so those kinds of things, if they've been given the training, that means they're not creating work for me. Believe me, I am busy when I'm in there. I don't have time to deal with amateurs. I just don't. So to that extent, I think it's important that Pam or Anne has that training so that they know what they're doing. Uh, don't come into an ed editorial board meeting, like a CEO recently did, um, came into the ed board meeting and said, this project, you know, it, the cost, the, the benefits far exceed the cost. I said, well, can I see the study? Um, he said, well, we can, we, it's not for public consumption, we can give you a summary. And immediately, my antenna is a summary. I want the full report, I want the appendices to know whether the discount rate that you have used is actually translates into, I mean, A, have you used the assumptions which are showing me a net present value calculation which is completely on your side as opposed to looking at it a little more carefully. So don't come into that meeting and tell me that immediately, guess what? I am digging around to find out whether the costs actually exceed the benefits. So those are the kinds of things which will be helpful to know before you come into Edboard. Believe me, coming into Edboard at the Vancouver Sound now, Frankly, most no newspapers, <laughs> it is no picnic. No, that's okay, the I'm, board when you go in and you meet with the editors and the reporters together as a politician. We are not, uh, I'll treat you, I mean, I'm welcoming and I'll give you coffee, but I'm going, okay. I'm, not, I'm not your friend in there. Okay, let's take one last question from the audience, if we've got one here, okay. We've got a microphone at the back of the room. We're about five minutes away from wrapping this Following session. Following up on Fazil's point about um, re reporters doing three stories, whereas before they used to do one, I don't see how you do it at all. Everybody's blogging and tweeting and writing three stories or four <laughs> stories, and I'm astonished that there are fewer mistakes. But to speak to the larger picture about why people are perhaps not as engaged in politics overall, I think it has a fair bit to do with the lack of local reporters in Ottawa. When I was in the press gallery in the mid-70s, there were eight to 10 reporters from British Columbia alone. Now there's Peter O'Neill, is he? No, so he's there's there. nobody. He's there. And, and I, he's there, so there's one reporter. And I think what that leads to is everything being given a totally national slant. Nothing is reported on Ottawa from a BC perspective unless it's got a huge BC component, and even then it's by somebody who maybe gets out to Vancouver twice a year. I think it's changed the dialogue entirely. I don't see it changing, but I think somebody should write an academic paper on it sometime. So without the breadth of reporters, you don't have the depth of coverage, and therefore you don't have the depth it's of knowledge. It's not even the, de the breadth of reporters. I think it's pro probably 
the locality. I mean, if you're reporting for a British Columbia outlet, yeah. you are watching out for British Columbians, what the MPs are doing, what they're saying, and how it affects BC. You can't get that if you're not from here reporting for an outlet from here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can I, I want to answer that question. Let's address uh, it quickly. The brief that we have given Peter O'Neill is that he would look at federal political issues from a BC perspective. That's the brief he has. And then as far as columnists go, Barbara Yaffe, we are not using national columnists. We are only using Barbara Yaffe so that she can reflect the BC perspective. But she's not there. Which, you know what, frankly, it's a good thing because the herd mentality in Ottawa amongst the reporters in the press gallery drives me bananas. So I want a fresh perspective outside rather than being captured in the Ottawa press gallery. So we've got Peter there as well as Barbara so that we have the BC angle. I, mean, I agree with you. Okay, we're going to do the 30-second wrap for each of our panelists because I'm very conscious that we're almost out of time. What's the solution? How do you create a better dynamic between politicians and the media in order to improve our democracy? Winnie. Uh, going back to the original idea that I first started, the empty chest, I think we need to start filling that in. And one of the good reasons is uh, that, you know, what, what can we fill it in? Um, climate change, environment. Um, those are issues that young people care about, and young people affect their parents. And I think right now that the, the interest in politics is low, is so low, because people have nothing to look forward to. So we know that we are now down to the oil sands, which is pretty dirty. And what is after the dirty oil? Nothing. So why are we not talking about the renewable energy, things that young people and their parents can plan ahead and look forward to? So that has to be, you know, and I, I talked about earlier on the, um, uh, okay, I'm sorry, just the <laughs> last thing that the 2011 federal election, I was really disappointed when I look at the reports that in the debate, so Green Party leader wasn't even included in the, the, the only conversation that everybody was listening. And then the, uh, when there were uh, environmental issues raised in the debate, it was completely ignored. So how can we have interest in politics? Anne? I, uh, First of all, I just want to say I couldn't agree more with what the woman in the back has said. When I started in politics in 93, we had lots of people uh, from Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, the, uh, Winnipeg, and so on in the National Press Gallery. By the time I left in 06, they were virtually all gone. And uh, it, is, it, it is, I think, a real problem. We are a diverse, fragile federation, and you need those people in Ottawa. And the good ones don't become hostage to group think, if you like, because they are, in fact, always pulled back. Their focus is what's back home. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more, and I think we're poorer for it as a federation. Let me just say that I think the public has a big role to play here. We focused on politicians and the media, and the, it's their, that relationship. I actually think at the end of the day, um, what drives how politicians act and what drives what you put in your paper, to some extent, is the demand, right, from the public. What do your advertisers pay for? Uh, why do they advertise in your paper? Well, because uh, a certain group of people pick up your paper and they then go out and buy whatever. Um, we, as the public, have a big role to play here. And I will say one thing, that if we uh, reward voyeurism, in our media presentation, the subjects that are covered and the way they're covered, we will get more voyeurism. And I believe profoundly that the public needs to stand up and, if you like, vote with their feet in terms of uh, what they want to see, whether it's on um, television, radio, or in the newspapers. We all need to smarten up. Thank you. Fazio. Improving the relationship between the media and politicians, the first step, it's just a simple step. Call up the reporter or editor or whoever is covering you, have a cup of coffee. That's a start. And Pam, I owe you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Last yeah. to you. Well, um, I like what you said, Winnie, about ideas and, and how Mike also framed that as the, the recruitment tool. And I would like to thank the leaders like Mike and Carol who were there 20 years as I was looking up at them and always had time for me, always, even as a student. That does work. I think that uh, what Anne and, and Fazil are talking about is stay open. Stay open as a leader to the value of the media, but mostly stay open to the citizens that we represent. And that, it just works. And the minute I decided 
uh, the media are there to stay, that's for sure, and let's work together, it completely changed my frame of mind. So I, I think it always boils down to what Mark Kingwell calls um, polishing ourselves on one another. All right, thank you all very much for your contributions.